won't be long. Better back them up, boys. It's Father's Day, and just before the, the kids leave and go to kids' church, um, King's Kids, uh, there's something I want to say about our kids. Um, I'm excited because our kids don't go to kids' church and learn Bible stories. They go to kids' church and they learn what the Word says. And I want to share a word with our children today. Um, there's two places. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 5. And uh, and we're going to look at uh, the first two verses there, and then we're going to look at a couple of verses in chapter 6. It is Father's Day, and this is the reason that... Uh, I want to talk about this. There's some things uh, fathers and mothers, adults and children alike that I want to look at here in chapter 5 for a minute. I'm giving you a chance to get there because I, I believe that if you see it in your own Bible, that then you're going to remember it. And if you uh, look at it on the screen, it's nice that it's on the screen, and we do that for... For those that uh, either don't have a Bible with them or, or, or aren't comfortable that they can get there quick enough. But it's important to know where these things are. Because as we know where these things are, we can do exactly what this says. Um, and, and I want to tell the father something in front of the kids. Because this is very important uh, as we, we get into this. Verse Chapter 5, verse 1 says, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children. And I don't care how young or old you are, you are a child of God. If you've accepted Jesus Christ at any time in your life, you are a child of God. Act like his child. I love a billboard uh, down here that used to be actually almost across the road and the property sold and it's, it's changed now. But um, on that billboard... It said, you are God's child, make him proud. And being an imitator of God as to your children uh, is important. And he gives us the next, and I, and I love the way the Bible is. It doesn't matter who wrote it, uh, that it was inspired by God to write. It was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And it says, and walk in love as Christ has loved us, given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma how do we sacrifice to God well I'm gonna suffer for God that's not what he said he said sacrifice you gotta have something if you're gonna sacrifice I don't care if it's finances I don't care if it's time I, I'm gonna tell you one of the things that seems to be uh, a hard thing in in most churches and and I don't I don't go to one of those churches okay so I know that this isn't you but if you do have a, a place that you have looked and reflected and go, well, you know, I don't know that I want to be involved because after all, um, there used to be a rumor around here that don't give the pastor an idea because you'll be in charge. There's nothing the matter with being in charge. Because when you're in charge, you have been given a vision. That's the reason I, I used to do that. I used to say, somebody give me an idea and, uh, and, and I'd say, well, you're in charge of it. Well, that wasn't because I didn't want to be in charge. It was because God instilled that vision in you. Well, here's what happens when we step up and we fulfill a place of vision. As, as a child and an imitator of God, we are literally making a sacrifice of ourselves, of our time. Maybe it's our finances. Um, you know, I know that there was a, a guy sitting on the front porch yesterday. He'd walked in off the highway. Now, the only time that that's ever bothered me is when I found one in a sleeping bag next to the building on Saturday night because I knew what time some of our people came. For instance, our worship leader gets here sometime just after 7 o'clock, and I didn't want her to walk up and find some guy in a sleeping bag here. So 
to walk in love and to be an imitator of God. I took him downtown and got him a hotel room. And then I picked him up the next morning. He came to church. But how do we do that? You know, I don't even know if there was finances to do that necessarily at that point, but I knew that it was a sacrifice. It was something that we would, if it's out of the norm, it's a sacrifice. If it's your normal thing, then it may not be a sacrifice. It may just be something you do. Now, the reason I'm talking to the children about this is because, um, and this is what I want to tell the parents, if you want your kids to learn the right way to love God, to love their neighbor, as Jesus said, do it. Bible says this. The Bible says that uh, if you want to have friends, show yourself friendly. Well, if you want to have children that do what God says, do what God says. It's pretty easy because they're going to be imitators of you just like it says here in Ephesians. One more verse, uh, kids, and I'm, I, I'm not going to hold you. I'm going to let you go to, uh, because I believe that there's a, a great vision for children's church today. And uh, it's important for you to get there. But go to the sixth chapter and verse uh, 1. Paul says this. He says, children, obey your parents, for this is right. Now, the next verse, he gives the reason that it's right. Children, when your mother and father tell you something, and, and, and you think, well, not really what I want to do. They know something you don't. And it's, it's not, and, and so I'm going to tell you, fathers, don't just tell your children no just because you don't know what else to tell them. Have a reason. You, you know, if it's, a, if, if, if it's not a decision, I, I used to tell my boys um, when uh, they, they got to a, a place that they started asking me things that I really didn't know whether it was good or bad at that time. I said, you know, if you, if you make me give you an answer right now, the answer is no. But if you give me a few minutes, I, I don't know that it's going to be no. And so they'd always walk away and they would give me a chance. Fathers, don't just tell your children no. Seek God's guidance about what you're doing. You know, and, and it's a no-brainer. If it's absolutely not good for them, then the answer's no. Um, but give them the reason why. It says to, to, to tells us uh, not to provoke our children to wrath when we reprimand them. Fathers, don't just reprimand your kids for no reason. Don't, don't make them feel that I, I can tell you, it also says, uh, spare the rod and spoil a child. And uh, I, I, I will tell you that I honor my father. He didn't spare the rod, and he didn't spoil the children. And, and I can tell you, all of, all of his boys love him and honor him. It goes on in the second verse, and I always love, you know, and, and Paul gave this, this thought. He said, for this is right. But then it says, honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. It's not just a promise of living long on the earth, but it's that it'll be well. That's also a promise of prosperity in your lives. And right now, because your young people and your father and mother are responsible for taking care of you, I promise you that there'll come a day that you will be glad that you've honored your father and your mother because as it's well with you means that you'll have everything you'll need and God will take care of you in that place. So go ahead and, and go to Kids Church and, and remember that. Remember uh, to uh, honor your father and your mother, and I'm sure that all of you have. I, I'm one, uh, I've heard from two of my boys already this morning, and, and uh, I, I'm just going to expose what one of them said. He told me, he says, uh, I want to tell you, thank you for giving me advice, even if it took me a long time to get it. Um, I guess I could share that same thought pattern with my father, uh, that uh, it may have took me a long time to get it, but I'm glad that he gave me that advice. And so, fathers, make sure that you give your children godly advice. Then, and as you do that, 
what will happen is, is they will have a reason uh, not only to honor you, but they'll have a reason that they will, honor, they will be honored by their children because you've honored your father and your mother, so you'll be honored by your children too. Same thought pattern is, is show yourself friendly if you want to have friends. Verse 4, and I'm gonna, uh, we're going to move on from this. Verse 4 sa- is the verse that I quoted a minute ago, and, uh, and I said this in front of your kids for a reason, because it's important that we do what the Word says. If we want our children to obey the Word, we want to do what the Word says. It, I want to be the example that says... Um, I don't know that I've ever uh, said this to... Uh, my dad before, and uh, since he's here today, uh, you'll, uh, you'll get a picture. My father, we never went on vacation that he didn't find church on Sunday. And I can't tell you that I always thought it was a great idea. We were camping in, in Yosemite, and we went clear across Yosemite to go to church at the campground church that day and and my dad always did that well you know what what I what I realized um, as years went by I did that to my kids because that was the example that I had lived and now I watch in in uh, not only his uh, well David shared something with me yesterday he was he was offered a great 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 job that was going to work in to be a lot of money. And he says, you know, I turned the job down because I realized I can't serve in my church the way that I want to serve because I aspire. He says, I went to Bible school because God told me to be in the ministry. And I couldn't enjoy, I couldn't be in the ministry the way that I wanted to be if I took that job. And and I watched, and what that was was godly advice that he followed. And so, fathers, be an example to your children. It, it tells you here, it says, don't provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. See, it's not just don't provoke them to wrath, but train them up in the way that they should go. And when they're old, they won't depart from it, is what it says. We're going to move on from that. And, and uh, I, I have some things that I, I want to share this morning uh, about Father's Day. Um, I want to honor you too. This happens more than you know. Until you started prayer time this morning, I didn't have a word for today. And that happens a lot. I say, Lord, what do you want me to, what what do you want me to share? Um, I got up early this morning. I had trouble studying. I study all the time, but I had trouble getting where the word is. Thank you for having prayer time. Thank you for being the leaders in prayer time that God's called you to be. And, 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 and the, that's so important to us because what happens is they not only cover this service, but they cover your house. They cover the things that God has instilled in them. And I honor that because of what God has done for us. I don't attend prayer time only for one reason. I don't want to know what's prayed out in there because there's too many times that I preach exactly what was prayed out. And I do not want ever to be operating in knowledge. I want the Holy Ghost. I love prayer time. I I, I wanted prayer time to be started. And when we started it years ago, and and, and, uh, I believe maybe... And I can't remember if I'm correct or not, Sue. If, if I'm not, then you can tell me later or you can tell me now. I think Sue was our first. No, you weren't our first prayer lady. Tam was, uh, I don't even remember what her name is, but she's blonde, whatever. Okay. Was it Tamara? Okay. See, we have more, we've had more than one Tamara, see. Um, and then Sue was our, our next prayer leader. And it was because... She had the vision. It wasn't that she necessarily felt like that's what she was supposed to do forever, and she did it for a season. And uh, this is the thing that we realize. Is, and, and, then, and then God sent prayer pastors to be leaders 
in that, that God had given, given a vision, and I honor that vision. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2. Verse 21 through 24. And uh, I'm only telling you not, not so you can read ahead because I, I always tell people it's not, you shouldn't be reading ahead. Uh, I, I tell you where we're going and, and, and how far we're going for our computer uh, so Kelly can have us ready. So the Lord cast a deep sleep on the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that spot. And the Lord God fashioned the rib that he had taken from the man into a woman. And he brought her to the man. Then the man said, this is at last, is this one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman. For the man, from, from the man she was taken. Hence, a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife so that they become one flesh. What does that have to do with Father's Day? Fathers, your wife is beside you. If you're not married... Remember this when that time comes. Your wife is beside you. She's not behind you. She's not under your feet. She's not to be tr uh, treated with contempt. But she's, t she's part of you. God gave her to you. And you're to honor her as a gift from God. Why am I sharing that on Father's Day? Because your children are going to watch you. And how you treat your wife will be exactly how they treat their wife. If you don't believe me, I can show you some examples. Uh, my father always loved his wife, still loves his wife, and treats her the right way. That was an example to me. Um, I can show you Another family here, and this isn't about pointing out families, but I look at how uh, the Williams are and how they treat one another. And I watch how their daughter has been treated by her husband because of the example that was given. And, and, and that's, that goes for several families here, but that just happens to be one that we can see two generations right here that of how it happens. Also, the, the Uri's and the Stover's, exactly the same kind of relationship. And, and so, fathers, treat your wife correctly. Treat your children correctly, and your children will treat their children correctly. And so, as we look at that, and as we, we realize we're one with God, and, and as we go into uh, this this morning, I, I want to make this more of not just about. Um, I'm not a. I'm not a. This is Father's Day. We're going to have a Father's Day message, but I want to look at some things that God has done. Um, this is uh, actually probably the first time that I've ever preached a Father's Day message on Father's Day, and it's because I looked and I realized what God has done in our life and some of the things that He's. What a beautiful example of how we're to treat our wives, how to, we're to treat our children, how we're to treat everybody else in life is how the Father has treated us. Because there is no greater example than, I, you know, I've given a few earthly examples, but there's no greater example of a father than our Father that's in heaven and, and how he treats us. Go to Proverbs chapter 6. Verse 20. It says, My son, keep your father's commandment and do not forsake the law of your mother. Now this, this in this place is, is a small f, so we realize that it's not talking about our heavenly father. <laughs> But, fathers, if you want your children 
to do what you say, do what your Father in heaven says. It's not burdensome. But instead, we're going to see that there are so many blessings that are tied to how I relate to my Father in heaven that is dependent only on me, not on anybody else. It is not dependent on how you treat your Father in heaven. It's dependent on how I treat my Father in heaven, how His Word comes alive in my life and the blessings flow down. You know, you can see exactly, uh, I, I, we have a, a, a parent that shared with me last week that uh, uh, they're, they're, they have a child that they had told them they could do this if, if they had a, a right attitude. You know, it's a good time to have a right attitude. How is your attitude to how your father relates to you and how you relate to your father? And that's exactly the same example that your children are going to follow because our children are the next generation. I listened this morning to, uh, actually, uh, Rudy Giuliani was talking about uh, so many of our uh, peop young people that are, uh, in all these uprisings right now have grown out, up without fathers in the house. And one of the things that we have to realize, fathers, you have a great responsibility even on how you relate to the world outside at what the relationship that, that your children are going to have with the world outside. And, and it's that attitude uh, that we come into, uh, you know. And so when we look at this and what, what uh, Solomon said about keep your father's commandment and don't forsake the law of your mother, it's important for us to realize that that relationship comes alive through our relationship with our father in heaven and, and how that happens. And then relating to earthly things also so that that relationship gets brought down to, from generation to generation to generation. Uh, Matthew chapter 19. In verse 19. If you have a red letter edition, you're going to find out when you get there that, that this is red letter. Now, <clears throat> you realize that I don't say that it's red letter very much because <clears throat> if the Bible says it, it's true. It doesn't matter if it's black letters or if it's red letters. Um, I've heard people say that, well, you know, this is red letter, so you can't argue with it. You can't argue with the Bible even if it's black letters, Okay. It just is a reflection that Jesus said it, and that's all. But all of it's important. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof. I don't pick out what I like and what I don't like, and I'm going to do, do what I like and not what I don't like. And that's the way a lot of, of Christians in the world do that. I realize I'm not in a room today uh, of people that do that. But when Christians do that, then they then they pick and choose what they like and what they don't like, and they're going to do what they do like, and they're not going to do what they don't like, then what happens if, is we believe uh, that uh, God didn't mean what he said. Well, the fact is God does mean what he says in every instance, and there are things that are tied with what he says that will reflect on the rest of our life. Here... Uh, Jesus was quoting the Old Testament about to uh, honor your father and your mother. He didn't talk about the promise here. But then he says, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. How do you reflect, how do you act towards your neighbors, towards the people that you work with? I promise you that if your children hear you make a statement about somebody else that is, that is not loving they're going to have the same kind of attitudes. We've got, to be, we've got to realize that this wasn't a question. And it's not really about whether our kids love their neighbor as their self. 
but how do you love your neighbor? It's a commandment that we love our neighbors as ourselves. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. You know, sometimes we, uh, we have neighbors or people we work with that there's no other way to say it. They're not godly people and they're knuckleheads. But that didn't tell, tell us that we didn't have to love them. We're still supposed to love them. How are you going to ever win them to Jesus Christ if you act like they act? How are you ever going to be a reflection of your father if you act like the world acts? So it's important for us to realize that how did Jesus act? Jesus, the only place you found him make a statement was when the religious leaders were trying to impose ungodly things on the people and trying to impose their thinking on the people and not God's thinking. And then he said, you're wrong. Did he still love them? He died for every single one of them. He cared about each and every one of them. Mark chapter 14 and verse 36. I didn't pull out both, both places, or actually it's three places that, that it said this, but I want to talk about a, a reflection of how we have fathers. Jesus here was talking about his Father in heaven. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Jesus was down praying right now that he didn't want to die. He didn't want to hang on the cross. He came for one reason on this earth. And that was to fulfill the will of his Father. And there's two things here that, uh, that stand out in this place. He said, nevertheless, not what I will. Doesn't matter how somebody else treats you. The Bible says, walk in love. I uh, had the opportunity last night at a wedding to walk in love because the people that parked behind me in the past had done something that was less than friendly to me. And let's just leave it at that. And uh, when they got out of the car, greeted me, came over, hugged me, shook my hand. And, and, and as far as anybody in the whole place knew, we were long lost friends. And, and I left feeling that way. I didn't have any animosity. How you feel inside will reflect on where you're at in life and how God will cause you to be able to Walk in love towards your neighbor and towards other people around you. But Jesus said this, and, 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 and it'll also show on your reflection. You know, Jesus was a great example of just because his father said it, that's what we're going to do because it's what you want, not what I want. And, and the other thing that stands out there, and I've talked about this before if you've been here very long, but I'm going to spend just a short minute on it. He cried, Abba, Father. That Abba, Father is a personal uh, family relationship. The great thing is, is we have that same kind of relationship with the Father. Nobody else can call my father dad but me. And my other brothers, of course, and, and Kathleen. Um, he, t he told me he didn't gain a daughter-in-law. He gained a daughter. So, you know, I realized that, uh, that there's some things that we could do. That's my dad. Well, that's really what Abba Father was, is crawling up, and it's a personal uh, family relationship that a servant can't call the father, that somebody that doesn't know Jesus Christ is their as their Savior, they can't go, Abba, Father, hey, Daddy. They can't, they can't give that kind of personal uh, greeting. And so if, if you want to give that personal greeting towards the Father in heaven, then you also want to make sure that you 
are an imitator of the Father of, in heaven. You're an imitator of Christ. Christ did that. He honored what his Father wanted. We know that he went and hung on the cross. So we know that right here was, an, was a perfect example that he didn't do, want to do that. But yet he said, whatever you want, I will do it. And he already knew what the will of the Father was, but he thought, well, I'll just ask one more time. Um, I'm pretty sure that most of us have asked our Father, uh, and I'm talking about our earthly Father right now, more than once about something that we really wanted. Um, and sometimes the answer was still no. Let's go on to John uh, chapter 14. Uh, verse 1. Now, I really wanted to pick up about verse 7, and, I, and, I, and as I was praying, and, and as prayer time was going on this morning, the Lord told me, He says, I want you to get a reflection on where you're going and uh, what, what it's going to be like when you get there. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. And where I go, you know the way. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Now, as I, as I reflected on that, let's stop there for just a minute, because as I reflected on that, I thought about, I know that you wouldn't believe that I would ever listen to what, how other people pray, okay? <clears throat> I have such a belief that what God said, He meant. What Jesus said, He meant. Some people, now, I want you to be careful because what I'm telling you is how you should operate not how they should operate because I'm not their pastor and you may not be called to instruct them. It may be that you have the opportunity to share some things at some point and so it's important. But I hear people pray all the time, Jesus, do this. Jesus, do that. Holy Spirit, do this. Holy Spirit, do that. That is not how God said to pray. Jesus himself said, don't ask me anything but ask the Father in my name. So when we pray, we're to go to the Father. It's the, the Holy Spirit doesn't speak of his own things, so he's not going to do something for you that God didn't tell him to do. He speaks of what the Father says. So why would I pray to the Holy Spirit? Why would I pray to Jesus? Because Jesus said, don't do it. He said, pray to the Father in my name. We're going to see that there's a promise tied to that. But this is, a, this is something that's important. So, I believe that most people that, that do what I just talked about uh, have not been taught. And it's important that we teach our children. Fathers, teach your children. Teach your children how they should operate and how they should believe God. God is well able to do everything that His Word says if I'll do what His Word says, if I'll follow what His Word says. And there are several promises in this particular chapter that's tied to that. Jesus went on in verse 7, He said, If you had known Me, you would have known My Father also. And from now on you know Him and have seen Him. Philip said to him, I, I, I was listening the other day, and I don't, I'm sorry I don't remember the guy's name, but... There was a guy that he has, his reputation is for 30 years, he has been a friend of the Jews, and he's fought anti-Semitism 
right here in the United States. And he retired the other day, and uh, there was something that was said about him uh, as he was retiring. One of the guys got up and he said, you know, uh, there's a story from the second grade about this particular man. What did Jesus say? He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Um, the teacher asked the guy, he says, what are you drawing? And he said, I'm drawing God. She says, nobody's ever seen God before. He said, that's all right, they will in a minute. <laughs> so how are people going to see God? They're going to see God in you in a reflection of how you react to your father and, and listen to what your father says. Philip said to him, verse 8, Lord, show us the Father, and it's sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, yet you've not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? And the words that I speak to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Listen to this. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, will he do also, and greater works than these shall he do because I go to the Father. And somebody says, well, that doesn't work for me. How do you react to the Father? Do you do what the Father says? Do you listen do you say, God, I will do it any way you want to? And how he tells you to do it, do you do that or do you do your own thing? Well, I'm not going to do the works, greater works, if I do my own thing. But if I'm in the Father, I'm going to do the greater works because I believe in, in him, I believe in his way, and I see the relationship to that. Believe... Uh, Verse 13, and whatever you ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified. Who are we going to ask? We're going to ask the Father in his name that the Father's glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father. Who did Jesus pray to? The Father. I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Holy Spirit's not an it, it's a what? It's a he. The Spirit, verse 17, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because he neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. A little longer, the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. At that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who keeps my commandments excuse me, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him, and we will come to him. And what? Make our home with him. God lives in our hearts. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, God lives in your heart. And when he lives in our heart, what does that do for us? Well, there's all kinds of things that, get, that are tied to that. One of the things is greater works than, than uh, Jesus did will I do. I believe that there's several things, and I've heard people preach this, and, and, and it, is a, it is a fact, but it is not the only fact. I've heard people say, well, Jesus couldn't give salvation at that point, so we can give salvation to other people. 
That is a great work, but it is not the only work. I'm here to tell you that he still opens blind eyes through your hands. He still opens deaf ears through your hands. He still makes the lame walk. He still, you can ask Scott Chapman about wheelchairs that get left in Nigeria during crusades because he's been there and seen what God does. Greater works than I do shall you do. Why? Just because you keep the word the way that he commanded it. He's given us, we live in the greatest time of, of ever in the, in the world because we have how many translations, I can't even tell you how many translations of the Bible. Last time I, I looked, there was 78 different translations of the Bible. Um, they're not all translations. Some of them are just uh, thoughts of what men think it says. And, and, but, the, but the fact is, there's hundreds of people that have the opportunity that they can't say, I don't understand what it says because it's not all King James. Um, and I still believe that uh, there are uh, pure translations that we should, we should uh, spend our time reading. But because I really want to know what, what God says. I really want to know how he said it so that I can understand from my perspective so that for my life I can walk in what that word is and keep his commandments the way that he said. And uh, that's not so that I can teach, but so that I can be a, a son to the Father and, and be a, a, an example to my children and to my church. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but it's the Father's who sent me. See, Jesus didn't even say things that he wanted to say. He said the things that the Father told him to say. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I'm not afraid of anything that's coming. I'm not afraid of anything that's going on. And I can tell you that God has manifest his self in great ways to you and I and will continue to do so, even in the face of trouble. Um, I said this last week, and, and uh, I'm going to remind you again because it, I saw it again um, posted on, you know, I shouldn't ever quote Facebook because I tell people I don't read Facebook, right? But I happened to get on the other day, and I saw this uh, about some churches that are springing up all over Iraq, and they're full. Why? Because ISIS is cutting off heads of Christians, and, they, and they're taking it? You know what? Even in the greatest face of trouble, the Father will be with you. Stephen, when he was being stoned, he looked up and he saw the heavens open. And he said, Father, forgive them, and I'm coming to you. I see. God will manifest. Jesus said, I'll manifest myself to you. He'll show you things uh, that, through the Holy Spirit that are to come in and how to, do, how, how to operate in those places if we walk in his word and we listen to what his word says. Verse 28. You know, if you don't have peace, spend more time with the Father. You'll have peace. No matter what's going on. There's no reason to be negative because the Father's not negative. The Father's positive. And he has positive things to say, and he'll tell you positive things, things that are going to be the outcome. I guess I'm, I'm going to stop for a minute because Kathleen and I, uh, a few years ago, we purchased a piece of property, and, uh, and, and, and we did it 
by the leading of the Lord in, in what we did. But I'm going to tell you, it was tough to pay for sometimes. And uh, I just believe God. I believe because he told us to do what we did, that he was going to take care of it. And even though there was sometimes it was almost like, man, I don't know that we just ought to just let this go. But that wasn't what he told us. Well, we sold it the other day for double what we paid for it. And, and in that, God is providing some things that, that we've been believing for. And what will happen is if you'll just listen to what God says and you'll follow through, even when things are tough, there's peace. He takes care of things. By the way, I don't have the money in my hand yet, but it's coming. Hallelujah. These things I've spoken while being present with you. Okay, I've read that already. Let's go down to uh, verse 28. You have heard me say to you, I'm going away and coming back to you. If you love me, if, you've, if you loved me, you would rejoice because I said, I'm going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. I will no longer talk much to you. For the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me, but, the wor but that the world may know that I love the Father, as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Arise and let us go from here. What did Jesus say? Because the Father gave me a commandment, I'll do it. I want to be blessed going and coming. I want to be blessed in everything that God wants me to have. I want to have the wealth that he promised. I want to have the peace that he promised. But I realize that if I don't do what he says, that I don't even have a covenant with him in that place. Because it was, it, we, we, said, we saw, he said, if you do what my word says, then you are my disciples. He goes on in the, in the 15th chapter, he says, uh, if you love me, you'll keep my word. Or because you keep my word, you love me. And, and so we realize that God has given us so many things that he uh, wants us to do. And, and, and the reason that this is so important for us on Father's Day is because your children will reflect on the Word according to what they see you. And if you became a Christian late in life, it's not too late to have a reflection on your kids. It's not, not we go, well, you know, I trained my children to, to do something that, that wasn't godly. No, today is the day that you make a stand that I'm going to continue to walk in the Word and, watch, and let my children watch me. Watch how God blesses me. Watch how God takes care of me. Watch how I, now I have peace. Because one thing they know is when they were growing up, if you weren't a Christian, you didn't have peace. You probably didn't do things that showed peace. But as they watch the change in you, what will happen is they will reflect on who you were and who you are and how God works through you in that place. I want to close with a promise that God has given us uh, as we keep His Word and we do what His Word says. It's found in the Old Testament. It's found in the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy. Some of you have seen this. Some of you have heard it over and over and over, but I want you to listen to it this morning because this is the promise of the things that we talked about in in the 14th chapter of John and, and how we keep the word. Chapter 28 of Deuteronomy says, Now if you obey the, the Lord your God and observe faithfully His commandments, which I have commanded upon you this day, the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. All these blessings shall come upon you and take effect if you will heed the word, the word of the Lord, your God. 
Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the issue of your womb, the produce of your soil, the offspring of your cattle. The calving of your herd, the lambing of your flock. Blessed shall you be in your basket, and blessed in your kneading bowl. You know, I, th I thought about something I'm in, uh, in Togo. And somewhere I've got a picture of it. There was a, uh, a roadside, uh, uh, I'm going to call it a coffee shop. It wasn't a coffee shop. It was a roadside restaurant. And, uh, and it was not food that I was going to eat because it's way too hot for me. Uh, but I went in with, with a bunch of uh, uh, guys, James and, and some other guys from the church. And in that place, the, the, the kneading bowl came alive because there's six women. They, they have a, a particular uh, bread that, that they, they break off. And, and it's not, it, I don't even know that it's baked. It may be like a, a raw tortilla or something. And, and they break it off and they... They dip it in the food, and that's how they eat the food. Well, the way they do it is these women have a great big bowl, and the way they knead it, they've got, it looks like baseball bats, only about a foot longer, and, and they're all beating it like this. And, and they're beating it in a way that each one of them's hitting it at a different time. And so it, it brought alive the kneading bowl because all of a sudden, this little thing that starts out about like this, as they're, as they're kneading it, I mean, it just kept growing in this bowl. And that's what the Word promises, that when it says that we're blessed in our basket and we're blessed in our kneading bowl, what starts out small, God is just going to make it begin to grow and, and how it grows. It just amazed me watching this and, and how they did it. And I'm trying to figure out how they ever learned to do that. How do we learn to do stuff? You know, the, the thing is, most of the time, the Bible gives us the answer, not particularly for how to knead bread, but, but uh, it tells us that we'll bless, be blessed in that place. Blessed shall be your comings, and blessed shall be your goings. The Lord will put to rout before you the enemies who attack you. They will march out against you on a single road, but flee from you by many roads. If somebody goes, well, I don't know what uh, translation of the Bible he's reading this morning. I'm actually reading uh, from the direct Hebrew in the Tanakh. And, uh, and I love the things that, that the way that he says, because he didn't just say, you know, our, most of our Bibles uh, say they'll come in one way and flee seven ways. And the Hebrew says they'll flee by many roads. And, and that means that when your enemy comes in, don't worry about it. I don't need to focus on the enemy. I don't need to focus on what the devil's doing. And I don't need to focus on what his people are doing. What I need to do is I need to focus on who my father is and my relationship to him and let him take care of it. David said the battle's not mine, but the battle's the Lord's. If the battle's the Lord's, what am I going to get involved in it for? I'm going to let him take care of it because he does a lot better job with it and getting me out of it than I could do on my own. And that's not, well, I'm going to try, and then if I don't succeed, I'm going to let him do it. I'm just going to let him do it because he's going to make them flee by many roads in that place. And you may say, well, what about those people that ISIS is taking their heads off right now? You know what? It's not promised that you won't be a martyr someday. It actually says that you might be. Am I looking forward to it? I've already told you I quit traveling with one guy because he prayed to be a martyr and I wasn't praying to be a martyr. But am I afraid to be a martyr? You know what? It doesn't sound like it's going to be any fun. But I get to wear a white robe and come back on a white horse. So, you know, there's, there's some blessing in that too, right? Now, I didn't just tell you that I wanted to be a martyr. I told you that I don't want to be, but I'm not afraid to be. The Lord will ordain, verse 8, the Lord will ordain blessings for you upon your barns 
What does ordain mean? Set out. Set apart. Put in a position. You know, when a, when a minister's ordained, what have they done? Not, what, what's happened? We've recognized the call of God on their life. That's all we did. We didn't call them. We recognize the call of God on their life. And when we recognize the call on their life, well, what have we done is we've set it apart. We've told everybody we recognize the call. That's exactly what God has done with the blessing. He has set you apart and recognized that you're set apart to receive blessing. He's made a plan that this happens. That on your barns, that means on your jobs, that means in your businesses. That means everything that you touch. Just exactly like he promised uh, Joshua. He says, everything you touch will prosper. That is a promise to you and I. He has ordained a blessing on you. Why? Because he's our father. What relationship do we have to the father? Dad may not remember this statement, and he might. Dad always had a saying. He said, as long as you stick your feet under my table, you live by my rules. You know what the Father says? The Father says, as long as you stick your feet under my table, these are my rules, and I'm going to bless you. This is a good statement. I can't tell you that I really appreciated it when he said it. But it was a great example of how my Father in heaven treats me. As long as you keep my commandments, this is what's going to happen to you. And that was that, that same kind of statement. As long as you stick your feet under my table, then you'll do what I say. And when you do it, this is what's going to happen. Verse 9, the Lord will establish you as, a holy, his, as His holy people. As His holy people. As He swore to you, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in His ways, and all the peoples of the earth will see the Lord's name is proclaimed over you, and they shall stand in fear of you. Fear doesn't just mean respect. It means they'll be afraid to cross your path. Because after all, the battle is the Lord's and not yours. And if you live that way, then what will happen is they're not going to get hurt by you, but something's going to happen. Don't mess with my kids. The Lord will give you abounding prosperity in the issue of your womb, the offspring of your cattle, the produce of your soil, in the land the, swore, the Lord swore to your fathers to assign to you. The Lord will open for you His bounteous store, the heavens, and provide rain for your land in, in season, and it will ble bless your undertakings. You will be a creditor to many nations, but a debtor to none. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail, and you'll always be on top and never at the bottom. If only you obey and fearfully observe the commandments of the Lord your God that I enjoin upon you this day, and do not deviate to the right or the left from any of the commandments that I enjoin upon you this day, and turn to worship other gods. I've always been per, per, amazed, and it's always perplexed me, at how God blesses people, and then all of a sudden they go do something else. Because God blessed me so much, I have more stuff that I can just go enjoy instead of coming to church. You know, this isn't about them, but it's always perplexed me why you would look at the God that blessed you and do anything different. And that's what he said. Don't deviate from to the right or the left. Don't do something different. 
I, uh, I was blessed this week. I, uh, I bought a bull a few years ago. Actually, Roddy and I bought a bull together, and then I wound up uh, buying him out later on because he wanted to be bought out. And, and uh, Is it raining? Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Didn't even know it was supposed to rain. But it does say he'll give us rain in our season. And I know that some people are going, you know, give us a little mercy. And, I, hey, this is Texas, and as long as it wants to rain, that's okay. I'm glad for that rain. Hallelujah. Um, I hope that those of you that live at Horseshoe Bend don't have to move out again. Uh, but uh, we're, we're going to believe that uh, that's not going to happen. So, you know, you could, you could look at this. You, you wonder if I had lost my train of thought. I didn't. You could look at this. I got 10 cents more than market for this bull, okay? 10 cents more than the guy had promised me I'd make, which, I mean, that was really good. That was a blessing, right? I still lose money, <laughs> even though it was better than it was supposed to be, right? So the next morning, a guy calls me, and he goes, can you get that bull back? And what do you want for him? And I told him, I said, I'm not going to, you know, there's no uh, bartering. This is how much it is. And I'd already called the guy that I'd sold the bull to, and he says, hey, just come get him. We do a lot of business together. And uh, I, uh, so I wound up getting every penny that I'd paid for this bull back out of him. But this was the testimony. It wasn't about me. This was the testimony. This guy was so excited because he wanted to have that bull. He'd actually owned that bull's mother. And he told me this. He said, last year, God healed me of cancer. This year, he gave me the bull I wanted. God blesses you. God not only covers the covenant that he has with you for divine health, but he covers the covenant of prosperity and giving you the things that you desire in your life. And guess what happened? Two believers got blessed. He got what he wanted, and I got what I wanted. And, and it's how God moves in that place. God loves you, and he cares about you. Again, this isn't about the bull, but it's about the guy that God, that his testimony was... God loves me, and God cares about me. And you know, it is so cool to watch how God, our Father, cares about each and every one of us and cares about the desires of our heart. What are the desires of your heart? Have you told your Father? If you have, and you're doing what His Word says, you're going to get those desires. Simply because God loves you. Father, I thank you this morning for the opportunity that you give us to be your children. And Father, I pray over each and every one that's here and each and every one that's watching by internet. Father, that you will bless them according to your word. Father, that you'll instill vision in each one. Not only of what you want, but how you want them to achieve the things that you've assigned to them as their blessings. The desires of their heart, Father, show them how to attain the assignment that you gave to them in that. And Father, I want to tell you this morning and remind you that we love you. And I humble myself and realize that I love you because you loved me. But I love you, Father. In the name of Jesus, amen. Remember that Jesus loves you and so do we. As you've watched today, you've had the opportunity to hear the word preached. And as you apply that word, you'll get victory in your life. But it has to start someplace. It has to start first with a commitment to Jesus Christ as making him your savior, and then making him the Lord of your life. 
Paul said this in Romans 10, 8 through 10. It says, but what does it say? The word is near you and it's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Well, the word of faith that Paul preached is found in the next verses. It says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. For with a mouth confession is made unto salvation, and with a heart one believes unto righteousness. So it goes like this. All you have to do is actually say, Jesus is my Savior and he is my Lord. So I'm going to invite you to say this with me this morning. Uh, and if you want to bow your head, you can bow your head. The Bible says that pray watching. And so it's okay to keep your eyes open and, and watch. But let's say this together. Say, Father, I know that you sent Jesus to die for my sins. I confess those sins today. I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me of those sins and to come into my heart and be my Savior. And I commit today that I will make you the Lord of my life. Thank you for salvation today. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you said that today for the first time, no matter what time of the day or night it is, uh, welcome to the family. Welcome to knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now from this day on, make Him the Lord of your life. And as you make Him the Lord of your life, you will find out what God can do in you and through you. Also, if you've watched this broadcast, we want you to know that you can become a partner with this ministry. As you become a partner with this ministry, some of the things that you've seen throughout this uh, presentation... Uh, the buckouts and, and things like that, then you become a part of that kind of ministry. And there's many people that come to know Jesus. We have offices in Nigeria and Togo, have four churches in Nigeria, one in, in Togo. And uh, we want you to know that you become a part of each and everything that this ministry does when you become a partner. You can see the information right there on your screen so that you're able to become a covenant partner with us. And as you do, we want you to know that we pray over each and every one of your offerings so that God will multiply it back to your hands according to his word. His word says in Luke 6, 38, that he gives back, pressed down, shaken together, running over to make room for more. The New Living Translation says whatever measure you use in giving large or small, it'll be used to measure what is given back to you. So we want you to know that God loves you He'll take care of you, and he'll multiply the seed that you sow in this ground with this ministry. Remember that Jesus is Lord, and Jesus loves you, and so do we.